Testing. <clears throat> testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Christopher H., you know what is up. Of course, we're going to start with testing. Those were the first words uttered on the creation of the universe. Is this working? Testing? Yep, all right. It's live. All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we're going to be, how's it going, Azur Waterf? Uh, we're going to be reading a paper called Meta Transformer, a Unified Framework for Multimodal Learning. Uh, so Transformer, obviously a type of network architecture, uh, very popular nowadays. And multimodal basically just means many modalities, where a modality is a specific type of data. And here, obviously, in this kind of very cool-looking picture, you have IMU, inertial measurement unit data. So basically, acceleration over time, hyperspectrum, graph, time series, tables, natural language, 2D vision, just a huge amount of different uh, data modalities there. This isn't the first... Uh, multimodal learning transformer we've seen. There was another paper that we read on this channel called ImageBind. This was a multimodal paper from Meta where they basically combined a bunch of different modalities but the way that they did it they built it because there was kind of a corresponding image for every single one of these other ones. But I think they're doing something different here for this paper. This paper was recommended by one of the viewers, and it's also part of the Hugging Face Papers list, so kind of relatively popular, so I figured we'd give it a little scroll. According to Joffrey Hinton, this multimodal is the future. Really enjoyed your image bind read. Hope this one will be insightful. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're using a uh, learning technique to create a model, Right, which is the neural net, it's really just representing the data. So uh, the more varied and the bigger the distribution of your data is, the, the kind of better that model is going to be. And if you're limiting yourself just to text, you're only going to be as good as that text. If you're limiting yourself just to images, you're only going to be as good as those images. So ideally, the, the artificial super intelligence of the future will for sure be trained on pretty much every single type of data that we have available. And these multimodal papers are kind of attempts to do so. Uh, okay, so we got figure one. Meta Transformer utilizes the same backbone. The same backbone. So backbone generally refers to the part of the neural network that is closer to the data. So in, in most neural networks, right, you have many, many layers, and then some of them are closer to the input, which is the data, and then some of them are closer to the output, which is sometimes called the target or really whatever you're trying to do. So the backbone is kind of the the part at the beginning. Uh, and encoding is just translating from the data into whatever representation or latent space you're trying to get to. But it seems like they're going to be using the same backbone to encode all these different modalities here. Natural language, image, point cloud, audio, video, infrared, hyperspectral, x-ray, time series, tabular, and IMU and graph data. So that's a huge variety there. Reveals the potential of transformer architectures for unified multimodal intelligence. Cool. Uh, I guess let's look at these group here. So this comes from the Chinese University of Hong Kong at the Multimedia Lab and then the Shanghai AI Lab. So all of these are Gmail accounts, which is kind of interesting. I didn't know they had Gmail. But Cool. 20 July 2023, so also relatively recent. Multimodal learning aims to build models that can process and relate information from multiple modalities. Uh, despite years of development in this field, it still remains challenging to design a unified framework for processing various modalities due to the inherent gaps between them. Uh, even just consuming these different modalities is difficult, right, because they all have different uh, representations just in their raw form. 
Uh, I mean, the beauty of Transformers is that they can consume any sequence, so I think largely the, the task of being able to consume a bunch of uh, data modalities with the same backbone and encoding them all into some uh, shared latent space is going to come down to how do we turn every single one of these data modalities into some kind of sequence. Uh, in this work, we propose a meta framework called Meta Transformer that leverages a frozen encoder. All right, so the frozen there refers to the fact that they're going to pre-train it and then they're going to freeze it, which basically means they're going to keep all the weights at the same value. So this is that's already as soon as you see that word frozen, there's going to be some kind of multi-part uh, process here. There's probably a pre-training and a fine-tuning stage, or maybe multiple stages. Uh, to perform multimodal perception without any paired multimodal training data. So the paired here is key, right? Because in this image bind paper from Meta, uh, every single one of these data modalities had a pair with images. So you had text and image, you had depth and image, you had heat maps and image, you had IMUs and image. So the fact that all of them had this shared image modality means that you could rely on the kind of pairing to figure out what the connections between the unpaired ones are. But you're not going to have paired training data for some of these, right? Maybe a point cloud won't have anything with a time series. Or a graph won't have anything with a uh, audio. So the lack of pairing is difficult, makes this difficult. Uh, the raw input data from various modalities are mapped into a shared token space, aka just some kind of latent space allowing a subsequent encoder with frozen parameters to extract high-level semantic features of the input data. Subsequent encoder, so you got two encoders. Or no, I, th I think the modalities are mapped into a shared token space. Okay, so they're turned into a sequence that is in the same form for all of them, and thus that encoder can consume this sequence of tokens no, which is basically every single type of modality and project it into this latent space that is supposed to encode semantic concepts. Composed of three main components, a unified data tokenizer. I feel like that's going to be the most interesting one, to be honest. I'm curious how they did that. A modality shared encoder, so one encoder that consumes all of that, and then a task-specific head. So. Uh, much like we talked about here, the backbone is the front part, or the kind of the the beginning part of the model. Usually the, the last couple layers of the model are called the head. And it used to be the case that uh, what you would do is you would basically take an already existing model, you would cut off the head, which basically just means take out the last couple layers and then add a new head and then train that head from scratch. So that's where the terms head and backbone come from. They come from kind of an older period in time. Uh, Meta Transformer is the first framework to perform unified learning across 12 modalities. There's that 12. Oh, shit. Control W. Experiments on different benchmarks reveal that Meta Transformer can handle a wide range of tasks, including fundamental perception, text image point cloud, audio, video, practical application. These aren't even tasks. This is like a data modality, so I don't know what they mean by that. And data mining. Okay, these are kind of weird. They're, these aren't even benchmarks, so I wonder what they kind of mean by tasks here. Meta Transformer indicates a promising future for developing unified multimodal intelligence with transformers. Code will be available at here. We do have the code pulled up. It does seem like it's a legit code base. Image. Segmentation. You got some scripts here. .sh is a script. You got some JSONs. Training these on V100s. These are kind of older. Right. Let's see. Do they actually have the model here? Can you download this model? Yeah, here you go. Here's the model. 85 million parameters and then uh, 302 million parameters. That's actually not very big. So I would have guessed that once you have this much data, right, especially from 12 different modalities, the model capacity you're probably better off with a much bigger model, right? Bigger model has more capacity, more ability to kind of learn the underlying patterns. 
The human brain is considered as the inspiration, processes information from various sensory inputs. Simultaneously, knowledge from one source can benefit comprehension of the other. However, it is in deep learning, designing a unified network capable of processing a wide range of data formats is non-trivial due to significant modality gap. And this is not, actually they bring up the human brain, but the human brain doesn't encode the different modalities in the same place. There's an auditory part of your brain, and there's a visual part of your brain, and then there's a motor cortex which connects to your uh, arms and stuff like that. So the the brain has separate encoders for the different modalities, and then there definitely is a kind of higher level uh, part of your brain that can consume all the representations from their, those lower level encoders. But the human brain is not doing what they're describing here, where it's not like uh, there's one part that can consume visual data and auditory data. Each data modality represents unique data patterns, making it difficult to adapt models trained on one modality to another. Images exhibit high degree of information redundancy due to densely packed pixels, which is not the case in natural language. Point clouds have a sparse distribution in 3D space. Basically just means that most point clouds are empty space. That's why there's all these fancy uh, storage data types for point clouds like octrees, making them more susceptible to noise. Audio spectrograms, this is just audio turned into images. Believe it or not, the way that a lot of audio is processed and generated is actually, or in deep learning specifically, is it's turned into an image and then that image is consumed with a vision model. Uh, our time varying non-stationary data patterns. Video data consists of a sequence of image frames, giving it the unique capability to capture both spatial information and temporal dynamics. Graph data represents entities as nodes and relationships as edges in a graph. Dude, IMO graph-based deep learning is kind of dead. Um, but maybe that's just because I never really got involved in that. Uh, owing to the substantial differences inherent to various data modalities, it is common practice to utilize distinct network architectures to encode each modality separately. And I'm this is what the brain does, at least as far as I understand. So, uh, Point transformer leverages vector level positions. Here's a couple different uh, papers. Basically, they're going to talk about all the different papers for each individual modality. Unified frameworks. Do they even mention image bind? They don't even mention image bind have improved the ability of a network for multimodal understanding, but they are more focused on vision and language. Vision and language is uh, what CLIP is, for example. CLIP is the vision language uh, encoder that is very popular in pretty much every computer vision paper at this point because it projects language and vision into the shared embedding space. Uh, if the brain region that encode different modality is different, how are they connected? Is it possible to connect different latent spaces if they are different? So I think it's more like if you look at, for example, CLIP, which is uh, what connects text and images, there's a separate text encoder. You see this? You see how text is first being encoded with this text encoder, and then image is then getting encoded with this image encoder, and then you have extra stuff after that, right? So there's a little bit of neural net before each f that consumes the raw form of each modality. Your brain is doing the same thing. So your brain has a part that's consuming the audio as has a part that's consuming the image. And then there's additional stuff afterwards. So there's kind of intermediate representations here and here that are in different spaces. If that makes sense. Uh, unable to share a whole encoder across modalities. No period here, it's already typos. The transformer architecture and attention mechanism for language processing have made, shouldn't the model know which modality the input is from? Yeah, they probably do that. I bet you that they pass uh, an extra token of information which tells the model which modality it is from. That seems like an easy thing that they could concatenate to the uh, input, to the sequence, and then it would probably help. So here's your 2017 trans attention is all you need paper. This paper has so many references or citations at this point. It made a significant difference in deep learning. These advancements have been instrumental in enhancing perception across different modalities such as 2D vision, 3D vision, and audio signal processing. These works have demonstrated the versatility of transformer-based architectures 
uh, this is something we saw even just this week. We read a paper called General Pattern Machines. Uh, trans language models are general pattern machines, but basically this comes from the fact that transformers can consume any sequence. And transformers that have been pre-trained on text, which is what large language models are, text is enough of a good prior for the real world that they can basically predict patterns in almost any uh, sequence, even weird ones like robot movement and uh, things like that. Whether it's possible to develop foundation models capable of unifying, ultimately achieving human-level perception across all modalities. I feel like perception is here is being used in kind of a vague way, to be honest. Like, what does human-level perception even mean? You know, they don't mention any specific benchmarks in this abstract, which is a little sketch. And then here they they say achieve human level perception, but that's not like a that's not a, a specific thing. So I don't know. Maybe maybe they don't actually <laughs> test against anything. All right, comparison between Meta Transformer and related works. Here you go. Here's Image Bind. Okay, so they finally reference it. Image Bind. I guess this symbolizes text, and then you have images, point clouds. Here you have a bunch of different other works. So clip, of course is going to be text and images. They do not share the parameters, so this is kind of what we've been discovering here, right, is that clip has separate encoders for the text and the image, so they're basically separate modules, but here in this work they're going to do, they're going to share the parameters, they're going to have one encoder that encodes all of this. And here the unpaired data, what this means is that clip requires paired data, so it requires uh, basically ground truth. You need to know that this uh, image corresponds to this text. There needs to be basically a ground truth, a human at some point that said this Pepper the Aussie Pup, this text corresponds to this image, right? So having to pair the data like that makes it much more annoying to clean and filter and you have to have labeling and all that crap and it's much more annoying, right? If you could just do this without having unpaired data, that would be a lot easier and that's what they're advertising here. But, I don't know, it's hard to do, so we'll see how they do it. Uh, in this paper, we explore the potential of transformer architecture to process 12 modalities. We discuss the learning process with transformers for each modality and address the challenges associated with unifying them into a single framework. Consequently, we propose a novel unified framework named Meta Transformer for Multimodal Learning. First framework to simultaneously encode data from a dozen modalities in the same set of parameters. There's a lot of repeating here. I don't know if you guys are noticing, I keep reading the same sentences over and over again. Meta Transformer incorporates three simple and effective components. So you have modality specialist for data to sequence tokenization. So it's converting the raw data into some sequence. Then a modality shared encoder for extracting representations across modalities and then task specific heads for downstream tasks. Hmm. So they say share parameters here, but do you think the modality specialists are sharing parameters? Probably not. First transforms multimodal data into token sequences that share a common manifold space. This kind of just sounds like an encoder, right? <laughs> then a modality shared encoder with frozen parameters extracts representations which are further adapted into individually tasked by updating the parameter of downstream tasks head and lightweight tokenizers only. Hmm. I think they're kind of playing with terminology here. They might literally just have a encoder for each modality, but they just don't call it an encoder. And then they have a second encoder that encodes what the, what the first encoders encode. Task-specific and modality generic representations can be effectively learned. We conduct extensive experiments on various benchmarks utilizing these images of the Leon 2B dataset for pre-training exclusively. So they only train on images? What's going on here? Meta Transformer demonstrates remarkable performance in pre-processing data, achieving consistent superior outcomes. More detailed experimental settings can be found in section D. In conclusion, our contributions are summarized as follows. We propose a novel framework which enables unified encoder to simultaneously extract representations 
We comprehensively examine the functions of transformer components such as embeddings, tokenizations, and encoders in processing various modalities. Valuable insights and sparks a promising new direction. And then achieves outstanding performance on various data sets regarding 12 modalities. What the fuck does this mean? Performance on data sets? Well, no, this seems a little sketchy. Uh, single modality perception, related work. So in this section here, they're going to talk about the related work. Let's see what they bring up. Multi-layer perceptron. Damn, dude, at the beginning, they're really starting with uh, ancient history support vector machines and multi-layer perceptrons. Okay, seems like kind of a, <laughs> a weird place to start. Hopfield Network's also super old. LSTMs, very old. GRUs, very old. RNNs, very old. They're really starting all the way from the back. LeNet is actually the original Jan LeCun net. That's, that's ancient as well. This is a 1980s paper. Yeah, 1990s paper. Damn, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm overstating the ancientness of this, but... AlexNet, VGG, GoogleNet, ResNet, these are all kind of early vision models. Uh, text classification, point cloud understanding, speech classification. Transformer architecture has developed various tasks such as text understanding, segmentation, audio generation. Similar applications of CNNs and RNNs, these networks are modified according to distinct properties and modalities. They, it's not just that they're modified, it's that the architectures themselves encode the priors that are useful for that modality. So convnets have a spatial invariance uh, prior that allows them to work very well on images where spatial invariance is important, right? So in an image, uh, let's say just image of a cat, right? the location of the cat in the image doesn't matter to knowing that this is a cat, right? It's like this same cat could have been in the lower corner of this image or it could have been in the upper corner of this image and it would still be an image of a cat. So having a, a feature map or a kernel that basically convolves across the image gives you this spatial invariance bias, right? And then RNNs, this idea that you're basically going through a sequence of things one by one, right, that kind of has this by or this prior of, of, of a sequence. So it used to be that uh, pretty much all the trans all the architectures that were used were specific to the modality and had all the priors for that modality baked in. Uh, information across can be complementary. It's significant to design a framework that can encode data from different modalities. Uh, I agree with this, but let's see how they actually do it. The advantages of transformers for perception are global receptive field. So what they mean here is that uh, all parts of the sequence can pay attention to all parts of the sequence. So in a transformer, the very like the very last word in the sentence can also can pay attention to the very first word in the sentence, right? So the receptive field is global, right? It's there's you have that global uh, connectivity potential or the option to do that if you want. Uh, and similarity modeling, which prominently facilitate the development of multimodal perception. MCAN proposes the deep modular co-attention networks between vision and language, which perform the cross-modal alignment by concisely maximizing the cross-attention. So I guess MCAN is cross-attention between vision and language, right, where you're letting the vision sequence or the image in the form of a, can I go back? the image in the form of a sequence can pay attention to the sentence or the language in the form of a sequence. Uh, then it becomes a consensus to utilize a cross-attention mechanism to bridge different modalities. With the success of pre-train fine-tuned paradigm, more works are getting focused on how to effectively align representations extracted across modalities by pre-training. I feel like the pre-training fine-tuning paradigm is actually kind of disappearing though, to be honest. Like, in-context learning is, to me, the future. In-context learning, or even LoRa, and these kind of, like, additional... Uh, even though they're called fine-tuning, they're not the same thing as, like, traditional fine-tuning, where you would basically push gradients through the whole model, or even just the model head. More works are getting focused on how to effectively align representations. VLBERT. Pioneers modality-aligned representations 
Oscar described the object semantics frameworks such as VinVL, SimVLM, VLMO, Albef, Florence. These guys very, very thorough in their historical uh, work here. What is in-context learning? In-context learning is whenever you basically... Uh, the easiest way to think about it is whenever you're talking to like a chat GPT, right? An LLM, you start uh, putting stuff in your prompt, right? You give it some examples of what you want in your prompt and then it starts to complete based on those examples. Those examples that you provided you're not, they're not going into the network as in you're not pushing gradients into the actual language model based on the prompt that you put, right? What's happening is that the tokens that are being generated are paying attention to the tokens that you put in the context, right? So in context learning means that the, the behavior of the language model is changing based on the context that you put in and that's called in context learning. But more specifically what I'm talking about is this, uh, general pattern machines, language models, is that you can provide examples. Basically, you can make a supervised learning data set in the context, and the language model is able to basically use that. So I, I like the example that they put here, right, or maybe here. Yeah, so you, in, in the prompt for the language model, you're giving it you're saying, this is the input, this is the output, this is the input, this is the output, this is the input, what's the output? And the language model no, can basically predict what the output is. But these examples, it's not like you fed it to the model in the form of a fine tuning where you were actually pushing gradients and feeding it batches of training data and calculating the gradients and then pushing those back. You, you just literally provided this in the context or in the prompt itself and it was able to learn. So that's what in-context learning means. Thanks, Christopher, for the uh, explanation there as well. Uh, Momo further explores training using the same encoder for image and text. Few shot learning. Despite these advantages, advantages there remain significant obstacles to de designing unified multimodal networks due to differences between modalities. Most research in this area has focused on vision and language. Which And this is also just because vision and language is kind of the most common modality, right? Most of the internet is basically vision and language. I guess audio is a pretty big modality as well, but like things like point clouds and weird things like... What else do they got here? Thermal, infrared, you know, like x-rays. Like there's a way less x-ray data than there is image data. And there's way less... Maybe maybe not. Maybe, maybe there is just as much... Uh, table data, but some of these are definitely, it's just also the scale is also why no one has used them before. Uh, Flamingo model represents a powerful few shot learner, but its transferability to point clouds is limited and it remains a challenge to leverage prior knowledge from one modality to benefit the other. In other means, existing multimodal methods have ex limited extensibility on more modalities, even though they have taken expensive training costs akin to how a bridge connects multiple riverbanks? <laughs> what is this analogy? <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird analogy. Okay, so that's the preliminary related work where they just kind of reference all the previous work that's been done, and now we're going to actually go into section three, which is going to be where they describe their meta transformer. Uh, we, predict, we depict in detail. Meta transformer unifies the pipelines of processing data from various modalities and fulfills encoding texts. Images, point clouds, audio, and other eight modalities with a shared encoder. To achieve this, it's composed of a data-to-sequence tokenizer to project data to a shared embedding space. I mean, that's literally what a token, what an encoder is. And then a modality-agnostic encoder. So, hmm, this is a little sketch. I mean, they're they're basically they're they're. In a language model, the tokenizer and the encoder, you can kind of think of them differently, but they're actually doing kind of the same thing, right? They're basically taking a raw form of data and then projecting it into or compressing it into a different manifold where it can be interpreted easier by the next level. So encoding and tokenizing 
even though they mean different things and they're used in a different way, like fundamentally are describing the same thing, which is basically you're, you're, you're taking data which exists in some distribution on some manifold and then projecting it or tra changing it, stretching it, morphing it into a different manifold and distribution. So here they're kind of making it seem like they're using, oh, we're, we have this modality agnostic encoder, but then we have specialized tokenizers for each modality. Well, another way to say that is you have specialized encoders for each modality, and then you have an additional encoder after that that further encodes it. So, I don't know, let's see. And then task-specific heads at the perform downstream predictions. We denote the input space of n modalities as x1, x2, xn while y1, y2, yn are the corresponding label spaces. Okay, so you have input space, which is x, and then output space, which is y. So the label is sometimes also called the target or the output, and then the input is the raw data. We assume there exists an effective parameter space theta i for each modality, where any parameter theta i in theta i can be utilized for processing data xi in xi. So you have a bunch of different modalities and then you have a bunch of different parameters. We see that the essence of meta transformer is to find theta star that satisfies this. I think this is union. Let me make sure. Union math symbol. No, it's the opposite. Which one is opposite of union, intersection. So ups, the U is means union, and then the upside down one means intersection. Let me actually pull this up, because it's a great little figure to look at. So you have two things, two sets of things here, A and B, and then this little upside down U basically means and. I guess that's a good way of remembering, but the intersection between them. Okay, so you have some theta star that basically matches, that is the intersection of all these thetas for every single modality. And what they're saying is that you can't cheat and say that the intersection between all of them is null, right? So like one obvious answer to this uh, puzzle here that they're proposing is that basically it's just a bunch of zeros, but they're saying it can't be that. The multimodal neural networks can be formulated as a unified mapping function, so a function that maps from one to another, one, one, one set of things to a different set of things. So you have this function f, and it's mapping from x, which is from x, big X, to y. Why do they have this y hat here? Where x is the input data coming from any modality, and y denotes the prediction of the network. Let's denote y as the ground truth labels, and the multimodal pipeline can be formulated as this. Okay, so you have the ground truth labels, you have the predictions that are coming out of the network. So y hat is the prediction. If this was, for example, a classification task, it would be the, uh, if this was a regression task, it would maybe just the, be the mean squared error. But what is y in this case is I guess what we're trying to get here. Because every single modality, it, like, what are you predicting here? Are you predict? Are you like classifying images? Are you like, what are you doing for like something weird? It looks like these are all classification, 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 segmentation, detection, part segmentation. Like these are all very different losses, so it's going to be difficult to propagate that back. Hmm. Okay, but theta star is the theta that uh, satisfies this up here, but then also is uh, results in the x that minimizes this loss function here. Meta transformer consists of data to sequence tokenization, unified feature encoding, and a downstream task learning. Okay, so I think I kind of understand what they're doing here. It seems like basically what they're doing is they're just, they have a ton of different uh, data from different tasks. So they have image classification data, they have point cloud segmentation data, and for every single point cloud there's some corresponding uh, 
Y, which is the label, which is the actual segmentations, and then they're just going to literally just push all of the gradients from all of those tasks into the same tokenizer here. Natural language images point cloud, data to sequence tokenizer. Here you have your shared token space. And then that goes into this unified multimodal model, which I guess is frozen here. And then you have your task specific heads. So one thing that's hard to do with this is like, how do you actually train this? Do you train this in, t do you do it all with text classification and then all with detection? Because when, when you do that, you're going to do, you're going to run into this catastrophic forgetting problem, right? Where you're going to basically, the tokenizer is going to get really good at this text classification and then as you push gradients related to this object detection task, it's going to get really bad. It's going to get increasingly worse at this, right? So are you interleaving the different tasks? Are you pushing them all at the same time and then you're waiting them? So there's a lot of details on how to do this. Uh, it should have honestly just focused on the five human senses. We propose a novel meta tokenization scheme designed to transform data across various modalities into a token embeddings, all with the shared manifold space. This approach is then applied to tokenization, account, taking into account where the practical characteristics of modality as illustrated. Text, images, point clouds, and audio. And I guess this corresponds to X text, image, point cloud, and audio is what the subs here represent. We use word piece embeddings with 30,000 token vocabulary. Uh, this is not the same one. I think the one that most language models right now use is called sentence piece. So what is word piece versus sentence piece? What is the difference between word piece and sentence piece? Summary of the tokenizers. This is terrible. Okay. Either way, they're using a, they're already tokenizing the text with this word piece tokenizer. The word supermarket is divided into super and market, and the word hosting is divided into host and ing. This is basically just how standard text tokenization works. Each subword is corresponding to a unique token, and then is projected into a high dimensional feature space with the word embedding layers. As a result, the input text is transformed into a set of token embeddings, n by d, where n is the number of tokens and d is the dimension of embeddings. So every single piece has some corresponding embedding, which has some dimensionality d. Okay, so then what are they doing with images? To accommodate 2D images, we reshape the image into height width channel. So this is the height of the, the image, the width of the image, and then the number of channels, which is usually three. Uh, into a sequence of flattened 2D patches. So this is basically what uh, vision transformers do. They're flattening the image into a sequence of patches. S squared by C. S is the patch size. And S is the resulting number of patches. A projection layer is used to project the embedding dimension 2D. So, I mean, this is kind of, <laughs> this is what we're saying, right? It's like, there is this really a shared tokenizer if word piece is only used for the language and then uh, the images are, have their own uh, tokenization into patches and then a projection layer, like, same operation for infrared images and spectral, sp hyperspectral images. So, they're already messing with the, image data separately and differently from the text data. So they're not starting from the raw data. It's not this this supposedly shared tokenizer is not actually consuming a raw audio spectrogram the same way that it consumes an, a text. It's like these things are already being projected into some d-dimensional embedding and then they're being fed into this shared uh, tokenizer. So that's kind of what I meant by it's a little bit misleading what they're saying. Because here they say, uh, 
up here share parameters right oh we're, we're sharing the whole the whole backbone so are you I mean I don't think you're sharing uh, the this projection layer right the projection layer for these images probably not being shared with the uh, text encoder here right so I don't know, a little bit misleading there uh, point cloud to learn 3d patterns we convert point clouds from raw input space into token embedding space so you have some point cloud which is a collection of points P is the size of the point cloud P points XI is PIFI so PI is the 3d coordinate of a point so XYZ and then FI is the feature of the ith point so where are they getting this feature from Sometimes it could, the feature could refer to uh, like the class, right? So sometimes these point clouds, they're segmented. So the feature would represent, in this case, the body of the plane, the air, the, the wings of the plane, the engines, and so on. So sometimes that feature is class related. FI contains visual hints such as color viewpoint normal. Okay, so actually this is what they're using. Color is just gonna be another three numbers, viewpoint, now you're talking about more like a nerf where you have the angle of where you're looking at that and then the normal is basically just uh, the line that's orthogonal to the surface of the object. We employ farthest point sampling operation to sample a representative skeleton of the original point clouds with a fixed sampling ratio of 1 to 4 so they basically downsample the point cloud by 1 fourth and then use k nearest neighbors to group neighboring points so they downsample it even further these point clouds can get really really big so generally if you want to deal with them you you have to make them much smaller just reduce the number of points p so clustering them with knn you can filter them as well filter any points that are kind of far away and and not close to other points Based on a grouped sets containing a local geometric prior we construct the adjacency matrix with center points of grouped subsets to further undercover the comprehensive structural information of 3D objects and 3D scenes. Okay, so this is how every single one of these data modalities is being consumed. Here you have images, XI, you have point clouds, and then what is A? Audio. We propose the meta scheme in containing grouping. The B to E represents the building blocks applied to our meta scheme of texts, images, point clouds, and audio spectrograms. Yeah, so this is not shared. This is not shared. This is not shared. These are not shared. Like all of these here, you can think of this as basically just like a very simple encoder, right? You're just using a simple handcrafted encoder to turn a point cloud into a vector and then that vector can be consumed by this layer down here, which is what they're calling the shared encoder. But is it really shared if you're already encoding these things? Hmm. Seems sketchy to me. We aggregate the structural representations from K subsets. We then obtain point embeddings as this. So this is the process that's going here with the point clouds. They're basically just progressively filtering it. So you can see how here the dimensionality is P, right? So this is point cloud. Every point cloud comes from all real numbers in P. And then here you see how they're dividing P over 4. So now this is smaller, lower dimensional, and then becomes even smaller, P over 16. So. And then audio spectrogram, we pre-process the audio waveform with a duration of T seconds with the logmel filter bank. So the logmel filter bank is actually kind of uh, designed based on the human audio mel uh, frequency, human hearing. Yeah, the mel scale is a perceptual scale of pitches judged by listeners to be equal distance. So it's literally based on human hearing, right? And that's... Uh, whenever you see a spectrogram like this, where does the spectrogram like this? Yeah, that's what that's what the y-axis is. So here, this is basically an audio or a sound. Then maybe this is a better example of what a real spectrogram would look like. 
and you have x-axis is time, so this is the duration of the sound, and then here you have basically the the which frequencies are are present. And a lot of audio classification or audio generation, even even generating audio, they basically generate these images. So they, they convert the audio into images and then they deal with it as if it was an image. It seems like that's basically what they're doing here. Uh, we employ a hamming window with a stride TS on the frequency of FS to split the original wave into T over TS intervals and then further transform the original wave into an L-dimensional filter bank. We split the spectrogram into patches from time and frequency with the same patch size of S. Audio patches overlap on spectrogram and we choose to split whole spectrograms into 12 over 100 T minus 16 over 10 by S by S convolution. So you see here how they're basically convolving the spectrogram much like you would convolve an image with a ComNet and then flatten these patches into a sequence so almost like a vision transformer and this even this doesn't sound unique right this is kind of you can see this in pretty much any random uh, audio paper they're going to be doing similar things to this so none of the these kind of like pre-encoders these modality specific encoders that they're describing here are novel. These are all kind of relatively basic ways to encode each of these different types of modalities. After transforming the raw inputs into a token embedding space, <laughs> you see they just keep avoiding the word uh, encoding. <laughs> We leverage a unified transformer encoder with frozen parameters to encode the sequence uh, of token embeddings from different modalities. We utilize a VIT, Vision Transformer, as the backbone network and pre-train it on the Leon 2B dataset with contrastive learning, which reinforces the ability for generic token encoding. What is this Leon 2B? Let's see. So it's text and images. It's around Leon to be. This is exactly what Clip, I guess, is trained on. Around six terabytes. After pre-training, we freeze the parameters of the backbone network. In addition, for text understanding, we utilize the pre-trained text encoder clip to segment sentences into subwords and transform subwords into word embeddings. What? <laughs> Wait, you're telling me that this here is clip? This little transformation here is literally clip? We utilize the pre-trained text encoder of clip. There's a pre-trained clip right here, just low key. <laughs> Following the common practice, we prepend a learnable token X class to the sequence. So actually, here's your uh, the answer to your question, uh, Christopher. They're, they are adding a special token, which uh, we prepend a learnable token X class, which represents the uh, the modality. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you maybe fine-tune the shared layer as one? Surely it must serve some purpose. Embedding space equals latent space. Yes, they're all, all of them basically mean the same thing, right? At the end of the day, you're basically just taking some data which exists on some manifold and then just changing and shaping that manifold and the data now exists on a slightly different manifold, right? But the an embedding and a latent are basically two words for the same thing. But sometimes they have more specific definitions, but just because they have more specific definitions doesn't mean that they're not the same thing, if that makes sense. Uh, to reinforce positional information, we incorporate position embeddings into the token embeddings. Okay, so they're also adding position embeddings once they've converted all of these things into 
a sequence of embeddings. We opt for a stand, standard learnable 1D position embeddings. In addition, we do not observe substantial performance improvements using more sophisticated 2D aware position embeddings on image recognition. So here what they're talking about is that the position embeddings that you would use in something like a vision transformer, vision transformer, uh, let's go here. Where's my, my favorite picture of a vision transformer? Here it is. Open image in a new tab. So in a vision transformer, actually this is fucking grainy ass pic. Let's get maybe this one. Yeah. Open image in a new tab. Let's do this one. This one looks better. But you're taking your image and you're turning it into these patches and then you're basically uh, feeding in those patches as if they were a sequence but you're also right so for each patch you have this linear layer here which is projecting it into a little embedding you see that little pink thing here is a little embedding that represents this patch but rather than just feeding only these little pink embeddings into the transformer you're also giving it this positioning embedding right this little uh, purple thing here and this purple thing which is a position embedding it's telling the transformer this little patch here came from this part of the image right and in a sentence right if this was text the position embedding just tells you this is at the beginning of the sentence and this is at the end of the sentence right but in a vision transformer because this image is fundamentally two-dimensional it's telling you this is the top right of the image or the top left of the image this is the top so it's like there's the there's this position embedding is 2d right not 2d in that it's like literally two numbers but 2d in that it's it's telling you not just uh, how, where you are left to right but also where you are top down so interesting here they say that uh, they do not observe substantial performance improvements using more sophisticated 2d aware position embeddings which is a little sketch to me. That means that whatever task they're they're doing is maybe not hard enough. We simply fuse the position embeddings and the content embeddings into an element-wise with an element-wise addition operator and the resulting embedding sequences are fed into the encoder. Okay, so basically similar to what's happening here, right? They're they're fusing concatenating these two and then sending it transformer encoder with a depth of L compromises comprises I think that's what they meant uh, multiple stacked multi-head self-attention layers and multi-layer perception blocks and this is a pretty standard uh, transformer encoder right multi-head self-attention and then you have your linear uh, projection layers or your multi-layer perceptrons uh, the input token embeddings are fed into a MSA layer first what's this MSA and then a MLP block. The output of the L minus one th th MLP block serves as the input of the ELF MSA layers. Layer normalization is applied before each layer and the residual connection is applied after each layer. So that's pretty much former tension is all you need. That's like pretty standard, I'm pretty sure here. So let's look at their encoder. So they're saying uh, the input embeddings are fed into the layer first. So the input embeddings here, they're just being concatenated with the input. Then they have the layer normalization before each layer. Here the layer normalization is after, but no now they normally do it before. The residual connection is applied after each layer. So the residual connection is this thing here, which goes off to the side. But in here it would be... Uh, because the layer the layer norm is happening here. So basically they output what comes out of the layer norm here and then they put it right there after. And then this feed forward here is the MLP that they're describing here. The MLP contains of two linear FC layers. FC here just fully connected. Just think of like a standard little neural net along with a GELU nonlinear activation. And, and GELU versus RELU. GELUs are basically just a fancy looking RELU but the shape is fundamentally the same. This is ReLU versus GELU. So 
ReLU is rectified linear unit, and then GelU stands for like Gaussian something linear unit. I forget, but basically you see how ReLU is completely flat and then linear, and then GelU kind of basically has the same shape, but then you have this like little bulge down here. And why is GelU important? The reason GelU is important is because it has a little bit of a negative uh, activation. It can actually send a negative number up to the next layer. So a ReLU activation means that the the little neuron can only send a positive signal. It can basically only, it can stay quiet, it can send zero to the next layer, or it can send a positive signal, right? But a GelU can actually send a negative signal up to the next layer, just a very small one. Uh, okay. Formulation of this transformer is this. MSA, MLP, okay, so here they're basically just describing this, uh, this part here, this encoder, transformer encoder. Let me drink some yerba mate real quick. Where the input to each layer, or no, the input at the very beginning, right, you have a bunch of these blocks stacked on each other, is this class token. Then uh, the embeddings for each of these different uh, modalities, so EX1 just means this thing here, right? EX all the way to EXN, and then here you have your position embeddings. Your position embeddings are N plus 1 cross D, and then your embeddings that are coming out from each of those modality encoders, and I'm just going to call them encoders, I'm not going to call them tokenizers, uh, are N by D. And then you have your layer norm here. Here's your residual connection. More layer norms, multi-layer perceptron. This is your uh, attention. And that's it. And then you have your Y, right? You have some amount of these layers, L1 to L. Cool. Uh, this means that with GelU, you can learn more complex functions. Yeah, it also, it's interesting because I think for biological neurons, biological neurons activation, I think in the neurons in your brain, they can only, they can only spike in a positive way. So in, when you have a little neuron like this, right, and it's sending a signal to the next little neuron, it can only send a positive signal, so it can only activate, and then the next neuron might take that activation and be like, oh, here is something to do, right? So for example, here's a, here's a very good example. Here's what a neuron looks like in a artificial neural network, right? You have a bunch of neurons in the previous layer that are feeding in some activation. That activation is getting multiplied by a weight, right? And these are the actual weights that you're learning over time. And then those are all summed up. They're added with this bias. So this bias doesn't even exist sometimes. Now they actually get rid of this bias just to be cleaner. You don't need it. It doesn't actually do that much. And then that's being passed through this activation function and then passed to the next neuron. But uh, think about it that way, right? If, you're, if you have a ReLU, you can only pass positive numbers. So this little neuron here can maybe pass either zero or a positive number, but with GelU, you can pass a slightly negative number. So you can pass basically an inhibitory response. You can say, okay, whatever the other people are, are sending, actually subtract a little bit from that. So I think that's kind of cool to think about. Okay, I'm getting distracted, sorry about that. Uh, after obtaining learning representations, we feed representations to the task-specific heads. Okay, so this is, uh, basically think of this like another multi-layer perceptron on top of this big stack of transformer blocks. H, theta H, and there's gonna be one task-specific head for each task, which is basically going to correspond to a modality. So they really could have called this modality-specific heads, which consists of MLPs and varies from modalities and tasks. The learning objective of the metatransformer can be summarized as follows. So you have F, your function which maps from X 
to y hat. F basically includes all of the different pieces that they've described here. That's parameterized by theta star. Theta star is the theta that results in the minimum of this loss function here, which is basically is going to depend on the task. So if you have a classification task, you're going to use classification loss. If you have a segmentation task, you're going to have segmentation loss and so on. And then F, G, and H denote the function of the tokenizer backbone and head. So these are first you tokenize, then you backbone, and then you head. But I just still feel like they're they're playing with terminology here. They're playing with words to make it seem like they're doing something more impressive than it actually is, right? Like I said, their tokenizer is really more like an embedding than it or an an encoder than it is a tokenizer. <laughs> And their backbone is really just an additional encoder, more so than a backbone. So, and their heads are all task specific. So, you know, it's like they're not, they're, they're, they're kind of making it seem like they have one encoder that's consuming all of these raw things, but really they have little modality specific encoders for each modality. All of those are. Uh, projecting into some shared space or, or into a, a uh, vector here that has the same dimensionality d and then because it has that same dimensionality d then the next level encoder which they're calling the backbone can then consume all of them but I don't know it's an encoder is it we perform experiments on each of the 12 modalities. We demonstrate the potential in for multimodal perceptron. Text understanding. We employ a general language understanding evaluation, aka the glue benchmark, which incorporates several different data sets. Why didn't they mention that they had these benchmarks before? ImageNet 1K, these are kind of pretty old benchmarks, to be honest. Base scale models are trained 300 epochs. Large models are trained on ImageNet, 90 epochs. Object detection, they use MS Coco. This is Microsoft. Common objects and contexts is very common. Detection data set, but these are all pretty old. Mask RCNN as the detector. Semantic segmentation, ADE 20K for 160K operations. Infrared X-ray, we conduct experiments on infrared image recognition with RegDB, chest x-ray, and Indian Pine data sets. For point cloud classification, they use ModelNet 40 benchmark consisting of CAD models across 40 classes with 9,000 examples and 3,000 validation examples. They use S3 DIS and ShapeNet part data sets for the point clouds. These really aren't like big data sets. These are pretty small. 16,000, 9,000, and this is kind of what I'm talking about, is that these modalities, like point clouds, just don't have anywhere near the amount of data that uh, image and text have. We utilize the speech commands V2, which has 105,000 one-second recordings. For video understanding, they use UCF 101. For time series, they have ETTH1 is a time series forecasting data set. We use the tokenizer of AutoFormer. I mean, <laughs> AutoFormer. Former. AutoFormer. Uh, this model, blah, 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 proposed. Extending forecasting time, studies, blah, blah, blah. We design AutoFormer, a novel decomposition architecture with an autocorrelation mechanism. Okay, so this is what they're using for the time series. So, like, they're using a pre-trained model for this. Like, it's already, it's, it's already encoded. Tabular analysis, 
And then for IMU, we evaluate to understand inertial motion and we conduct experiments with IMU sensor classification on the EGO 4D data set. Okay, so here is a summary of all the text that we just read. So you have all the data modalities here. You have the different tasks that they're using to push gradients for each of these. Most of these are basically classification. Classification, you have detection. Segmentation and detection are classification if you kind of blur your eyes. Action recognition, also a type of classification. Classification. Forecasting, this is really the only one that's uh, more akin to prediction in terms of next token prediction. I don't know enough about graph data to know what prediction here means. Maybe you're probably predicting the next node given previous edges and nodes, something like that. We follow the default setting of VIT Meta Transformer B16F. So this is telling you that their uh, store that the uh, data type they're using is uh, B float 16, which is a 16-bit float, but it's a uh, it's called the brain float, which has a slightly different allocation for the uh, exponent and precision terms. I think they're called mantis or something like that. Brain float versus float 16. Yeah, here we go. So this is your normal 16-bit float, and then you have B float 16 here. So you can see the it's the same number of bits, but the amount that are allocated to the exponent and the fraction are different. And most uh, deep learning pref uses this B float 16 as kind of like the go-to data type. Uh, with a base scale encoder, which contains 12 transformer blocks, 12 attention heads, and the image patch size is 16. So this is the number of patches that they're breaking down here. So here, this image, the, this would be nine patches, but they're using 16 patches. The embedding dimension is 768, so that's the D that they're basically encoding everything into, and the output dimension is 3072 for this MLP. F and T denote that the parameters of the encoder are frozen and tuned. We compare existing advanced methods for paraphrasing inference answering tasks. So what are they showing me here? These are different models. ChatGPT, BERT, which is another language model, pre-training, size 3.3 billion, then this is the score that it gets on these glue benchmarks. I mean, this is just straight up wrong, right? They're saying that here it's only trained on Leon 2B, but they mentioned that they're using a pre-trained clip encoder. Yeah, and they're using word piece. This is just not. Where do they say clip? For text understanding, we utilize the pre trained text tokenizer of clip. So there you go. So not all, they used the clip pre-trained text tokenizer. So if they're using the pre-trained clip text tokenizer, then it's not what they're saying here, right? They're here they're trying to convince you that they only train on Leon 2B, but it's more than that, right? Because they're using pre-trained models as well. Experimental results for image understanding. We conduct experiments in classification. Graph prediction is likely inferring missing links between nodes in the graph. So it's kind of like a masked uh, prediction task. Is that what you're saying, Josh? You have pretty much the rest of the graph, and then like part of it is masked, and you have to predict that missing piece. 
uh, an instant segmentation task on the ImageNet, MS Coco, and ADE 20K datasets where bold and underline indicate the best and second best result. Okay, so here you have Swin Transformer, ConfNext. These are all vision models. This is the resolution of the image that's going in, so 224. Seems like they have different sizes here. L, B, seems to be that L takes in larger images compared to B. So you have 320, 224 compared to 336. L also has roughly twice as many parameters. Takes almost 10 times as many flops. And then the accuracy is maybe 10% more. And compared to the Swin Transformer here, which I guess is the state of the art, you got 58 and then something like 43 for the big model and then 31 for the small model. So I don't know, this performance is pretty shit, to be honest. Experimental results for infrared and hyperspectral data understanding. All right, so the best models they have for infrared and hyperspectral data understanding are these MSCLNet and SMCL, which are seem to come in 22. These are conferences, so ICCV21 means some conference that happened in 2021. And this is the current best score of a mean average precision of 78. And comparing their B16, which is their actually their small model, you get a 65. This is probably R at one. Probably means uh, the the basically it has to get it correct. So the one basically means or maybe not rank one R at one mean average precision, overall accuracy, average accuracy, and the number of trainable parameters. So, I mean, I guess maybe I'm being unfair here because this model is way huger. You got 40 million parameters versus 1.8 million. You guys hear Boo? She comes here every time now. I think you're starting to, you're starting to love the camera and the microphone. Uh, what else we got? Natural language understanding. This is, we literally just read that. Uh, comparing various state-of-the-art methods. Is BERT state-of-the-art? I don't feel like BERT is state-of-the-art. BERT is pretty crap at this point. Uh, paraphrasing, sentiment, duplication, inference, answering. Achieves a score of 54. It still demonstrates competitive performance, adaptability, and potential for understanding natural language. Image understanding. Uh, exhibits outstanding performance when compared to the Swin Transformer on image understanding tasks with the help of the Clip Text Encoder, which is kind of what I'm saying. It's like you're you're leaning on the fact that the Clip Text Encoder has a bunch of has a bunch of inform like you know there's some intel intelligence in that Clip Text Encoder, so you're leaning on that. Uh, when the pre-trained parameters are further tuned, can outperform existing advanced methods uh, so this is their difference between their big model and their small model the latter outperforms both Swin V2 on ImageNet classification I just don't feel like ImageNet classification uh, benchmark papers with code let's actually see what the the top model is right now on ImageNet. So the top model, according to Papers with Code, is Basic L Lion at a score of 91% with 2 billion parameters. This is a 2023 paper. And what do we got here? We got 88% uh, with, where are we at? 88% with 191 million parameters. So actually that's kind of impressive. It's way less parameters and you're getting 88, which is right about 
here-ish. So it's like kind of a 2020 model level performance. And the ImageNet benchmark, this image classification, like the last 9% is extremely hard. So like this is kind of why you're seeing this kind of flattening out is because like it's getting to the point where squeezing out extra percentages on these benchmarks is like you almost have to overfit to this benchmark in order to get those last couple percentage points. Uh, what did the MSA from above in the encoder stand for? Sorry if I missed that. MSA? Control F MSA. Is that like one of these metrics? Is that what you're referring? Shit. You're talking about this? This is the attention. MSA attention. MSA attention. I think it's multi, multiple sequence alignment. No, that's not what I want. MSA attention uh, architecture. MSA transformer, no. Multi-head attention. I think MHA is kind of, you see that multi-head? but I don't know what MSA is specifically. I think it's basically just the attention mechanisms just based on what I'm seeing here, right? So this MLP corresponds to this, then LN corresponds to the layer norms, right? The layer norms here. So the only missing piece here is this orange block, which is MHA would be multi-head attention. MMHA would be masked multi-head attention. Uh, here you have self-attention, and here you have cross-attention. So maybe what the S stands for is self-attention. So maybe it's multi-headed self-attention. So MH, MHSA, I think, would be what they wanted to put. Yeah, I think it's self is what I would guess. But yeah, actually, here you go. So it's multi-head self-attention. But that's weird. Like I've never seen that like that. I would have I would have called this MHA. But yeah, we solved the mystery. <laughs> um Okay, I think we were here. Point cloud understanding. Pretty close, but I mean they're comparing here to point MAE with 21 million parameters, 0 0.6 million parameters. What is going on here? This is saying 0 0.6 million parameters, but here it's 1.8 million parameters and here it's, one hundred ninety one million parameters like what the fuck is going on like why do they keep changing that you know what I think is going on I think what's going on is that they're not counting the encoders they're only counting the task specific heads right so they have a task specific head for each task right this head H and here when they're telling you uh, 191 million parameters, 1.8 million parameters, that's not the entire model, that's the specific head, which is actually incorrect because here SMCL, 40 million, that probably includes all of the models, or, or, or the entire model, including whatever uh, uh, backbone they have and whatever other extra crap they have, that 40 million is all of the parameters versus this 1.8 million here, that's only the task specific head, which is incorrect. So again, misleading yet again. Really annoying. Lots of smoke and mirrors here. Outperforms Meta Transformer in both object detection. The Meta Transformer has similar performance. Demonstrates competitive performance even compared to Swint Transformer. 
Uh, table 5a represents the performance comparison of MetaTransformer and other advanced methods on RegDB for Im infrared image recognition. Rank 1 accuracy of 73% and an MAP of 65, which I guess compared to SEVIT, which probably stands for, I don't know what that stands for, what does SEVIT stand for? Self-Ensembling Vision Transformer for Robust Medical Image Classification, okay. 85 million parameters and then here they're pretending that they're able to achieve this with 0 0.75 million parameters but again that's incorrect because this is just the task specific head significantly fewer trainable parameters <laughs> uh. And the reason they're claiming that is because they're freezing the encoder. So they're freezing the encoder, and then they're saying, okay, but because we freeze it, we don't count it, and we only count the head. That's very sketch. For x-ray images, similar to dealing with infrared, we take the same image tokenizer as common visible images. Yeah, so they're using the same modality-specific uh tokenizer which I really think should be called the uh, uh, encoder because I think that tokenizer makes it th makes it feel like it's actually more simple than it is but it there is trainable parts inside of it results on 3d point cloud understanding showcases the experimental results for point cloud understanding comparing the performance of meta transformer with other state-of-the-art methods using 2.3 million parameters again overstating or under under reporting the number of parameters to make it seem like they're more impressive like you know like this this is just so misleading here I can't even take them seriously this is like this is pissing me off AST Accuracy, 97, 78. That's kind of a big difference between these two models here. Achieves improved performance with a higher number of train parameters. And then video recognition. Again, the same fucking trick every time only contains a negligible amount of trainable parameters of 1.1 million to obtain an accuracy, but this is like straight up fucking false. Like your entire encoder is way more than that. <laughs> Suggesting the potential benefit of a unified multimodal learning and less architectural complexity. I don't know, does it have less architectural complexity? We conduct experiments on several widely adopted benchmarks, weather and exchange, time series forecasting, we report. Yeah, exactly, Christopher. That's exactly what uh, I'm saying is that you could make, uh, you could have a tiny little multilayer perceptron on top of GPT-4, a, a multilayer perceptron which has like 10 neurons in it, and then you can say, I'm getting GPT-4 level performance with 10 neurons. <laughs> Uh, okay, following TimesNet, we report the number of trainable parameters from four different prediction lengths. Okay, so I guess time series forecasting, I don't know much about that too. Time series forecasting is what, uh, like, hedge fund people, so like if you're, if you're making uh, models for financial data, I think that's what this, it falls into this uh, category. And I guess the sequence lengths that they deal with there are 720. That seems kind of small. I would, you know, I feel like the, Transformers can consume like 8,000 tokens at this point, so I would guess that you would have more than just 720, but that's where we're at. Uh, most of the model parameters being fixed. Meta Transformer can still outperform existing. Most of the model parameters are fixed. The number of trainable parameters is very few, only 19K trainable parameters. Meta Transformer can still outperform Informer. When 2 million parameters are trained, Meta Transformer can directly outperform Pyroformer. Therefore, Meta Transformer's pre trained on perception task can also be applied to time series forecasting. And then tabular data understanding. 
These are ancient GBMs. Tab transformer. Kind of seems like this benchmark is too easy. Everybody's getting the same score. Achieves a slightly lower accuracy on adult senses, but performs better than all other methods on bank marketing data set. The world's most exciting data set. Graph data understanding. We conduct experiments on the P PCQMM for MLSC. This is this is the craziest name. This is like the world's craziest data set name right here. PCQM four MLSC. Graph transformer. MAE mean average error. Getting a much higher score here. And then IMU data understanding. Various graph neural network models for graph data understanding the PCQ M4M LSC dataset. In contrast, Metaformer B16F delivers the train and validation scores, which reveals the limited ability of current meta transformer architecture for structured data learning. We conduct classification on the Ego 4D data. All right, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Limitation here. Let's see if they're at least able to be a little bit self-critical. From the perspectives of complexity, methodology, and further application, the limitations of the meta transformer are summarized as follows. Meta transformer requires O of n squared d, right? So this is big O notation, usually used to denote computation cost. You actually have different big O's for computation and memory, and usually those are you can trade off between those. D is the dimensionality of the embeddings that come out of each of the what they're calling tokenizers, but are really encoders. And then n squared is the dimensionality of the uh, sequence. Dealing with the token embeddings E1 to EN, high memory cost and heavy computation burden make it difficult to scale up. Compared with axial attention mechanism in time S former and graph former, meta transformer lacks temporal and structural awareness. That's not even true. It is aware of temporal Right? Any sequence is inherently temporal, right? It, it's a sequence and there's some notion of like this happens at the beginning and then there's this and then there's this and then there's this. So there's inherently the time prior is baked into the into any sequence. So I don't really know what they're meaning here. It may affect the overall performance and tasks where temporal and structural modeling plays a role, such as video understanding, visual tracking, or social network prediction. What? Meta Transformer primarily delivers advantages in multimodal perception. It's still unknown about its ability for cross modal generation. We will work on this in the future. In the early stages of artificial intelligence development, pioneers introduced the multi layer perceptron to address perception tasks in machine learning. <laughs> what a reference! <laughs> Later, recurrent and convolutional expanded AI capabilities in multimedia data processing, achieving significant success in extracting representations from text, images, point clouds, and audio. MLPs have since integrated into deep convolutional networks. What the fuck does that even mean? MLPs are already deep learning because you have multiple layers, right? The deep and deep learning means that there's multiple layers, there's a depth and MLPs are not integrated into deep convolutional networks. They're usually added on top of a convolutional network uh, as a head, right? This paper, we explore the potential of plane transformers from unified multimodal learning, highlighting a promising trend towards developing unified multimodal intelligence with a transformer backbone. To some extent, this paper supports the dominant position of transformers in next generation networks. Importantly, CNNs and MLPs are not left behind. They play essential roles in data tokenization and representation projection. This project process exemplifies the law of succession in neural networks and the ongoing evolution of artificial intelligence. This, like, what is going on in this paper? They're just talking about nothing and something, like, you know, they're just extremely vague and high level. Let's see if there's anything in the appendices here. 
Time to transformer, extensibility, video recognition, audio video segmentation, unified architecture, efficiency. Conclusion. Yeah, okay, we're gonna end this paper here, but let's do a little summary. So today we read Meta Transformer, a unified framework for multimodal learning. This was a paper that actually kind of got quite popular. It had a bunch of upvotes here on the hugging face, and but I'm starting to think that the reason it was popular is because they had a transformer on like a literal transformer in their picture. So they, they definitely knew what they were doing in terms of a kind of like a viral marketing kind of situation where you put this big picture right in the beginning, you have all these different modalities here. But then once we it started to be a little bit a little bit fishy, right? We started to we saw utilizing the same backbone. And as soon as I saw that I was like, oh that's kind of intense. Like how are you going to use the same backbone for all of these different data modalities when they're they're so different it's difficult you can't even feed them into the same backbone, right? And I thought that they might be doing something tricky, like they might even be converting, they might even be reading the image as a sequence, right? Right, this kind of like byte level uh, uh, sequence stuff that you see sometimes where everything is just turned into basically a sequence of raw bytes and then you read that and then in that way you can, you can basically see every single data modality as just a sequence of bytes. But that type of stuff is very tricky, so I was like, okay, maybe they're doing that. But then kind of when we dug in deeper, we realized that what they're doing is they're just taking every single uh, modality here and they're encoding it into an embedding. So every single modality has its own separate encoder and then they have an encoder that consumes these embeddings and further encodes it into a uh, new embedding and then that embedding is what they're calling their uh, unified uh, representation, right? But this one by one conv here, this flatten, this S by S conv here, this projection here, this convolution, all of those are not shared. These are unique to each modality. So right off the bat, what they're claiming here that they share their parameters is bogus, right? They're, they're not shared. Only the specific backbone is shared. So that's that. Then what else? Then basically they have task specific heads for each of these different classification tasks and then they're feeding gradients from each of those different classification heads or each of those different classification tasks into this uh, unified encoder that they're talking about. And then that unified encoder is what they freeze and then they basically use that for a bunch of benchmarks. And they show that they're you know quite good at all these benchmarks. They're about on par with what you would expect. But the problem is that, or one thing that I didn't like about that is that they kept trying to pretend that they were using way less parameters than everybody else, but the real thing is that they're only counting the parameters in the task-specific heads. They're not counting the parameters in the encoders, so I don't know. And then, yeah, honestly, not a lot of good things to necessarily say about this paper. They're, they're a little bit misleading. They're trying to kind of do this smoke and mirrors trick to pretend that, that there's more going on here than there is. There is no unique, uh, there's no novel architecture here, there's no novel training strategy here. There's no unique uh, thing that they're doing. There's no new data set. L literally the only thing that they're doing is they're basically grabbing a bunch of modalities that already exist, a bunch of data sets that already exist, putting one encoder in between all of them and then just pushing gradients into that. Which would be fine if they did that, but the amount of kind of like miss like kind of smoke and mirror stuff that they're doing here is a little bit misleading. So I don't know. Shame on them. <laughs> uh, catching the tail end of the stream. 
enhancing clip they do use clip so they literally use clip in here they have the pre-trained clip and they're using it to encode the offers went to some conference but we're not able to show the miser and the data seem very sketchy yeah actually the so that superconductor video stream blew up which is kind of weird because it has absolutely nothing to do with deep learning so it's kind of weird to me that out of the hundreds of stream i've done like something like 200 something streams the one that explodes is the one that has nothing to do with deep learning, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, it seems like people are saying that it's not, uh, it might actually be a hoax. It might not actually be a superconductor. So that's actually kind of sad. Like some people have this kind of like gotcha energy, but to me that's actually sad because I feel like if it would have been a superconductor, that would have been so, so cool, you know? Um, uh, Tanvir, image bind was far superior. Yes, I think image bind was way better uh image bind was meta's uh it's basically clip uh 2.0 it's not clip 2.0 it's clip 1.1 if you want to think of it that way but it's and the reason image bind is clip 1.1 is because the uh overwhelming majority of the data is image and text and they're just kind of like adding this imu heat map and depth but i think if you actually look at the latent space of this it's not changing much it's basically the same manifold and latent space as as the original clip just now you have the ability to project depth and heat map and imu into it um but there's actually three papers crazy story it's a mess yeah i think we it should be pretty soon right i feel like within a week or two somebody's actually going to make it and then will actually know, right? Because it's not that hard to make is what we were realizing in yesterday's stream, or two days ago's stream, is that you basically just have to bake these like pretty common materials in like a relatively low temperature. Something that you can buy off the internet can get to that temperature. So I feel like within a week or two, we should know exactly if it's true or not. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go do some other stuff, but Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, thanks, Christopher, Creative, John, Tanvir, Josh, Azir. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Uh, thanks for suggesting this paper, whoever did it. And, yeah, you guys have a great weekend. See you guys later. Peace.